you know, we went through some of the highland areas, and, uh, and I just want to, th this slide here is of uh, one of the, uh, the vertical gnomons. Now, Izampa is an astronomical site. It's oriented in different ways. It's oriented to Takana Volcano in the north, but it's also oriented uh, to the southeast, to the December solstice sunrise. And then also you have these, in group B, these vertical zenith measuring devices. They're vertical pillars, they're like gnomons. They measure the angle of the sun. And the sun, on two days every year, can be right in the center of the sky, and on that day, it casts no shadows on a measuring device like this, okay? Now, there's been this um, policy, I guess, to put green sheds over some of the monuments because they have very delicate iconography and carving on them. They get weathered, you know, and, and so it's natural to expect that some of these should be covered to protect them from erosion. Well, these don't have any delicate iconography on them. They're just big, a big ball on top of a big pillar. There's no reason to protect them from the weather. And when they decided to put the green shed over this, they effectively um, destroyed its function as a solar measuring device. So, kind of clueless. Kubal Khan doing some fire ceremony there. You know, the fire ceremony really is a, is a process of making a sacrifice offering into the fire. The fire is transforming. It opens up a sacred space. And uh, it's about creating community. And uh, the fire is the transformative thing. Now, it was great uh, to, to have with us um, one of the great uh, pioneering archaeologists of Azaba, Garth Norman. Uh, he did a lot of the archaeological work at the site in the uh, 60s and 70s. And he's uh, still very uh, active. And I, I just couldn't believe it, because when I was doing my research uh, and stumbled across his APA as the place to investigate, it was the Brigham Young University studies that one had to go to. And several of those were authored by, uh, by Garth Norman. And they're published in like uh, 76, 1976. So, um, that was the source for me. With all the maps, and I could figure out the alignments and the astronomy and stuff, uh, it's just incredible. Mary Lou Riddinger and Garth Norman, and here we are. Garth is still tracing around the site, and he's uh, still, uh, you know, he was with us for all the fire ceremonies. He was, here we are at Takalikaba. And he's still getting around, exploring the site. And I met other Maya authors like Gaspar Gonzalez, and we had presentations by Robert Sittler, who authored The Living Maya, and Gaspar himself is the author of a book called 13 Baktun. Here we are at Takalik Aba. The fire ceremony, uh, the preparation with the four directions and the four colors. It's really an amazing thing to, uh, to experience. And here we are setting up at Azapa. And Jim already showed some of these slides, so you get the idea. Uh, these monuments are really important at Azapa. Here we have Stila 25, which depicts um, an episode from the, uh, the Maya creation myth, but it also depicts astronomy. And when I first visited Azapa in 1990, and uh, visited the museum a little bit later than that, uh, this was like stuffed away in the back room of the museum, you know, like against the wall or something like that. And I think of this as a very, very important, it's like the Rosetta Stone or something like that. And uh, there was a lot of ceremonial shamanic activity going on around the area with mushroom stones and so on. That seems to have been a part of the uh, Maya religion. Um, and here we are at Azampa, right outside the ball court. Here you can see the, uh, the throne, the ball court throne in the background there and uh, the whole group assembled around the, uh, the fire ceremony. Uh, okay, so top Rigoberto, we were invited to uh, go to the town council group, and you know, here's, here's the whole group, and, and here, here are the Maya Aki, uh, so it's it quite an honor uh, to be honored in this way. They invited uh, several of us to speak, and Todd Rigoberto got to the podium and said some very amazing things. And one thing he said, I, I just was very moved. He said, 
Let's remember the wisdom that comes from our ancestors. Their wisdom was so profound. We cannot project ourselves into the future if we do not look back into the root. The future is our past. We cannot deny any of the three phases of past, present, and future. We have the privilege of having this time now to receive and adapt the ancient and ongoing sacred ceremony. I thought that was just so beautiful because it's it's like it's kind of a traditionalist perspective, but it's an adaptive, it's an adaptational traditionalist perspective where he's willing to be open to the now and uh, transform the traditions of the past so that they can stay alive and vital uh, in, into the future. This was the final ceremony uh, near Mobostenango, the traditional area where da, uh, Tabri Giverto is from. And it happened, uh, nobody planned this, but it happened the day before uh, a lunar eclipse in, uh, last June. And this is the group from the, from the tour. It was really kind of an amazing culmination of, uh, of all the work that we've been doing and, and uh, conceiving the idea, the Maya Conservancy getting, uh, getting uh, you know, launched and, and Jim Reed and George Ann Johnston, the president of the Maya Conservancy, doing so much and to, uh, to bring it all together. And, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, within 12 hours of when this picture was taken, uh, early the next morning is when the uh, lunar eclipse happened, and I believe that Madison actually uh, saw it. Uh, there was a moment when the clouds parted and, uh, and, and the lunar eclipse happened. Now, another research project that uh, is supported by the Maya Conservancy has to do with uh, the investigation of this carved boulder that came to our attention um, about uh, two and a half years ago when we were at the site of the Zappa talking to the locals and apparently there's a lot of undocumented carved monuments in southern uh, Chiapas. And uh, so with our contacts in the area, we able to identify this and in uh, June of 2009, I was able to go and document it and clear it off and identify all the different things that are going on in this amazing carved boulder. It's about 15 miles north of the Zappa in the mountains. And just briefly, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit. Um, here it is. There's elements going on here like uh, fish and uh, what do you call this? A pelican or what? Yeah. And uh, and here's an interesting thing. This is um, obviously it's a caiman. It actually looks like the caiman that's depicted on Stila 25 a little bit with this these kind of designs on it. But there's three cut marks here. Cut, 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 and in Palenque, there's an inscription, it's a creation myth inscription that Michael Grove explored, as well as David Stewart explored this in his 2005 book on Palenque. But it has to do with the chopping of the cosmic caiman three times, which then separates the universe into three different parts, the underworld, the human world, and the celestial world. So I thought this was very interesting that we have a caiman here that's got uh, three cuts on it. it. At the very least, that image suggests the idea of sacrifice. Okay, as does this element over here. You have a, like a skull face. And you know, I, I drew out the image, you know, when you're there at the, at the site, you can look at it from different angles, and you can really, you know, put water on it, and you can really figure out what's going on there. I mean, maybe you can't really see this, but, but this is a skull face, and, and the guy's holding uh, a sacrifice ax. And there's another head here, okay? So again, on this side of the monument, you have the idea of sacrifice. Here's the whole monument from the front. So here's, here's the, the, the axe chopping head. Uh, over here you've got the, uh, the, the caiman uh, over here. And something's going on here in the middle. And uh, this seems to be the central focus of the whole monument. Because you have things here and things here. And they're all sort of like attending what's going on here. And this is what it is. Uh, pretty interesting, you have on the left an incense burner, you have that cosmic caiman that's cut, and then a frog, and I think all this involves like sacrifice imagery, like the incensarios, you know, those incense is like an offering, it's a sacrifice offering to the, to the spirits, you know, invocations and stuff. Over here you have the, um, you know, the chopping of the head, that's a sacrifice thing, and up here it's very interesting, you have this 
sort of sky deity. It's kind of similar to that last page of the Dresden Codex where you have the cosmic monster in the sky and it's like, you know, vomiting out, you know, fire, not fire, but like liquid or water, something like that. And that seems to be used as an indication of like the cosmic flood or a period ending thing. And, uh, you know, it's all imagery that suggests perhaps that, you know, the themes that I see going on in this, now the central image here is the, the classic, the classic hawker position, they call it. You see this on different monuments and stuff. It's the birthing image. It's a birth image. So you have the birth image and the sacrifice image and transformation. Those are the themes that I have seen at Azabla. Those are the themes that I think are present for the Maya at, uh, at period endings. Sacrifice, transformation, and renewal. So like I said, there's lots of uh, undocumented monuments all around Azapa. Um, like this one here, this, when we were leaving uh, Azapa, we were having lunch and somebody came up to us and said that you know, they had this monument. And uh, she was a couple miles away and we went over there. It, it seems like, uh, like a pot belly sort of figure. You see those kind of a lot. But I think stylistically it's very, very old. I mean, it reminds me of like the Olmec style. Uh, it could be even an insect kind of creature with these different, it almost seems like it has multiple arms with a human face. But it's interesting that there's this bowl on top and it can hold water and reflect things. If anybody has any ideas what this thing is, uh, I mean, I guess? Well, you see he's in Peru as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, I think the theory or idea is that when they were filled with water, one wouldn't have to look up at the right. sky. Exactly. Have a fixed position and track That's actually what I was thinking too. We might have had this conversation. And because at Palenque there are these rectangular um, pools, I guess you call them, between the building structures. And they're only about like a foot deep. And archaeologists were like, what is this thing for? And then they thought that, you know, if this was filled with water, it would be like gazing down into the underworld. And there is this idea that the night sky is the underworld. So you'd see the stars reflected in this still water of the pool. It's like they a scrying device. Draw, so like a, um, right. Line. They could have grids and figured out relationships and stuff like that. Yeah. Pretty amazing stuff. So we can get into the 2012 stuff here a little bit. Uh, this is kind of the background that will set the stage for talking about Portuguese Monument 6. 